Maybe I'll give it just one minute. People trickle in kind of over the first minute. Sure. And it's I'm it's going. an hour, right? Oh, I, someone said hi, but I didn't. Lisa. Oh, hi, Lisa. There you are. <laughs> the video wasn't popping up. How are you? Very good. How are you? Good, good. Yeah, last push until the holidays. I'm leaving for Australia tomorrow. Ah, I hope you have a relatively uneventful flight and travel. Thank you. Experience. That is the best wish anyone could. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> could oh, wish that's for. That's right. That's right. I mean, you asked about the time. Yes, it's it's an hour, and then there's you know 10, 15 minutes for questions. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Just wanted to make sure. Try not to run over time. All right, so I think we may as well uh, fire up here. So welcome everyone again to the Western Hemisphere Colloquium in Geometry and Physics. Uh, today, we're delighted to have Natalie Paquette speaking to us about causal duality and twisted holography for asymptotically flat space times. Okay. Take it away. Thanks a lot, Andy. Thanks for the invitation. Um, hope everyone is staying healthy and is about to enjoy a nice holiday season. Um, it's a pleasure to be back speaking at this at this wonderful series. Um, today, I'm going to talk about something rather different um, from what I talked about uh, at uh, my previous uh, Western Hemisphere colloquium. I'm going to uh, talk about the program of twisted holography, which I've been thinking about uh, for a few years with various collaborators, and how it can be applied to the study of holography in asymptotically flat space times um, and construct ultimately an interesting toy model top down from string theory for a holographic dual pair for not an asymptotically ADS space time as we're familiar with, but rather an asymptotically flat space time. And uh, for the mathematicians in the audience, I'll try to touch on how this connects to the subject of Kazool duality um, at various points. Okay, um, so today's talk really arises from kind of a confluence of progress in a few different subfields where the points of contact in these different subfields um, are really at the level of symmetry protected or universal physics in various senses, which I'll explain. So the side of the story that I'm coming from is twisted holography. And the purview of twisted holography, roughly speaking, is to take top-down string theoretic examples of the ADS-CFT correspondence, which preserve some amount of supersymmetry, and try to restrict our attention to a uh, supersymmetry protected or BPS subsector of that physics, by means of a procedure called twisting. Um, and BPS quantities, as I think everyone in, in this audience knows especially, uh, are particularly amenable to rigorous mathematical reformulation. And so studying the duality on both sides in this twisted context, really um, trying to elucidate the mathematical structures in the bulk and in the boundary and uh, clarifying the dictionary uh, is a really useful way to make progress on understanding the dictionary and holography and finding new ways to organize and compute various uh, supersymmetric observables. Um, and the outcome of performing these kinds of twists turns out to be, again, roughly speaking, uh, or the result is an open closed duality for topological strings, which are also, I think, very familiar to many in this audience, uh, both for their physical utility and for uh, their mathematical richness. So we'll see, roughly speaking, that uh, on the boundary, uh, the outcome uh, or the open string sector in the twisted framework often leads to things like holomorphic churn Simons theories or their dimensional reduction, which yield chiral or vertex algebras as kind of the twisted remnant of the supersymmetric boundary theory. And on the bulk side, the twisted remnant of the bulk supergravity or perturbative string theory is going to be um, the Kadira Spencer theory of gravity or BCOV theory, which is familiar from the closed topological string. So twisted holography is all about taking these protected quantities on the bulk and the boundary, uh, protected in the sense of being supersymmetry protected, and matching them in detail and elucidating the mathematical structure. Um, and chiral algebras, uh, in particular, the sort that we get from the twisted boundary CFT, or twisted boundary theory, are going to play a starring role uh, in this talk. And the other subject that twisted holography has turned out to have um, some overlap with uh, often goes by the name of celestial holography. It's a program that's been studied in recent years and uh, spearheaded by Andrew Strominger and many collaborators. Um, and celestial holography um, 
has at least historically taken a more bottom-up perspective in trying to elucidate what is, um, you know, how should we think of holography uh, not for asymptotically ADS space times, but for asymptotically flat space times, Minkowski space. Um, and celestial holography in particular posits that the appropriate holographic dual for a theory of quantum gravity and asymptotically flat space times um, isn't a co-dimension one conformal field theory, but rather is a co-dimension two conformal field theory uh, that's supported on the so-called celestial sphere that resides at asymptotic null infinity. So the, the hypothesis or the proposal is that a four-dimensional uh, theory, a bulk theory in asymptotically flat space time um, uh, is holographically dual to a two-dimensional conformal field theory supported on the celestial sphere. And again, there's been, you know, this has been uh, largely so far a very bottom-up proposal where people study, um, again, universality at the level of low energy or deep infrared physics, studying the soft sector and the symmetries thereof uh, in these four-dimensional field theories, and try to deduce um, you know, if there exists a putative dual celestial CFT, what kind of properties does it have? How does one match between the two pictures? And how can one reorganize S matrix computations in the bulk uh, into covariant conformal correlators in this putative boundary theory? Um, so it's at the level, um, or, you know, you know, so far a lot of the emphasis has been at the level of matching asymptotic symmetries and performing these kinds of studies from a very bottom up, um, again, universal perspective. And uh, as we'll see, this uh, subject will turn out to dovetail nicely with twisted holography in ways that I'll try to make precise over the, the course of the talk, or at least give, uh, at least try to give the big picture. Um, so as I said, today what I want to do is start to flesh out some of the connections between twisted holography methods and ideas, which again, uh, can be thought of as a kind of open closed duality in the topological string and uh, Kazool duality and other things, and connect that to the celestial holography program at the end of the day. And it turns out that a very fruitful way to flesh out the connections between twisted holography and celestial holography, and even a good way to study celestial holography in and of itself from, from a different point of view, is to study holomorphic theories on twister space, which is a six dimensional complex manifold that I'll remind you of shortly. And it turns out that these holomorphic theories on twister space provide um, a very natural six dimensional bridge between four dimensional and two dimensional physics. So four plus two is six. And so maybe you anticipate some kind of connection, um, but in particular, uh, holomorphic theories on twister space will provide a very useful lens for understanding aspects of a putative celestial holographic dual in two dimensions to a bulk four-dimensional uh, theory in asymptotically flat spacetimes. And a bit more precisely from this perspective, for local holomorphic theories on twister space, which are very special creatures, uh, Costello and I proved an isomorphism of the following kind, which I'll build towards throughout the talk. We proved that uh, form factors in these four-dimensional theories are, well, first of all, they're interesting non-vanishing observables for holomorphic theories that come from twister space. Um, in particular, the a four-dimensional theory that one can derive from these holomorphic theories has computable form factors, which you should think of as scattering amplitudes in the presence of a local operator insertion. And these natural four-dimensional observables uh, turn out to be isomorphic to correlators of a certain two-dimensional chiral algebra. So I'll review this 4D, 2D dictionary and connect that to the holographic stories uh, proposed by Strominger and, and also by analogy with ADS-CFT. Um, so ultimately, uh, using these holomorphic theories on twister space and ultimately looking for um, their topological string theoretic uplifts, we'll be able to obtain a top-down example of twisted holography, not in an asymptotically ADS space-time, but in an asymptotically flat space-time. So these ideas will eventually merge and, uh, and give us a new top-down holographic duality. Uh, but there's a, a lot of insight and input from various fields uh, and a bit, of a, a bit of a build up before we get there. Uh, so that's just going to be where we're going in this talk. Um, 
Now, I am certainly not an expert on Twister space. There are many such experts, uh, some of whom may be in the audience. But let me just very briefly kind of motivate what sort of an object Twister space is. Um, and of course, it has a long storied history going back to Penrose, Ward, um, Lebrun, many, many others. Um, but let me just briefly kind of motivate the sort of structures that Twister Space can tell us about, um, because they'll be the structures that we're going to be interested in uh, for the rest of the talk. Uh, before I get into uh, the introductory material, just any questions about the motivation and the picture and, and where we're going? No? Okay. Great. So just for those that aren't familiar with Twister space and what its role in life is and why it should be a natural object to study in the first place, let me um, sketch uh, an analogy uh, in two dimensions that's useful to keep in mind as sort of a motivating structure. So in two dimensions, a natural thing to do is to study the complex uh, wave equation in two independent complex variables. So Z and Z tilde are independent complex variables in C2, um, which equally well you can think of as the complexification of two-dimensional Minkowski space. And we can construct complex analytic solutions to this massless wave equation. And because of the, the nature of the equation, it depends only on the conformal structure of the underlying two-dimensional manifold. Um, although again, I'll focus on Complex, uh, complexified 2D Minkowski space, or C2 in this example. And from these complex analytic solutions of the massless wave equation, it's well known that we can restrict uh, to various uh, slices um, and restrict to natural solutions of uh, to, to other equations of interest in various space-time signatures that we're more naturally interested in. So for example, if we take Z tilde and specialize it to the complex conjugate of Z or Z bar, then we can obtain from, um, these, uh, from the solutions of the complex wave equation, solutions to Laplace's equation on two-dimensional Euclidean space, or if we specialize Z and Z tilde instead to independent real variables, we can obtain solutions to two-dimensional wave equations on 2D Minkowski space. So by studying, um, so by passing to a, a complex uh, space-time manifold and studying the resulting uh, complex massless equations in that setting, we can naturally generate solutions to the massless equations, uh, massless second-order equations that we're interested in in more physical signatures. And this is a useful organizational gadget for that. And moreover, we can also fix some initial data on um, various suitable slices of complexified Minkowski space and um, and obtain solutions over some appropriate complex domain of dependence, which can again be specialized, for example, to the usual domain of dependence of a solution to a massless equation in Minkowski space, et cetera. So this is a very useful geometric structure to give us solutions to, in general, nonlinear massless Natalie, field equations. Natalie, I have a question. Sure. Z, Z, could you go back one slide? Um, so let's see, you have null lines through Z and Z tilde. Those are, are those complex lines? Yes. Complex yeah, they're complex lines upstairs. Z, Z tilde? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Hi, hi, Greg, by the way. I think that was Greg, right? I, I don't have uh, images yes, on my screen. Uh, yes, okay. Thank you, thank you Nolan. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, sorry, I can't see anyone's video just to see my slides. Um, okay, so very roughly and morally speaking, Twister space is kind of the analog of doing this procedure for four dimensions. Um, but whereas in two dimensions, if we have some two-dimensional space and we choose the orientation and, and um, are a little bit more careful, you know, we have a unique complex structure and we naturally pass to the complexification of Minkowski space in that setting. And moreover, for example, any harmonic function in two-dimensional Euclidean space is the real part um, of a holomorphic function. But in four dimensions, life is not so nice. And the reason that Twister space is more complicated is essentially because uh, of, of um, the subtleties that arise in four dimensions when we try to do um, the analogous thing. In particular, in four dimensions, if we choose a conformal structure for our, uh, for our manifold in an orientation, we have not a unique complex structure, but a family of complex structures that are parameterized by a two sphere or a copy of CP1. And roughly speaking, Twister space is puts all of these complex structures on a democratic footing. 
So for the rest of this talk, when I say twister space, I mean this, I mean projective twister space, which as a real manifold is R4 cross CP1. So for every point in R4, there is a two sphere, which for physicists, you should think of as parametrizing uh, the null directions uh, associated with that point or the uh, massless momentum. And uh, more precisely, as a complex manifold, twister space is given by, uh, and sorry, this arrow is, should be a little bit more centered. Um, it's given by a non-trivial vibration of two line bundles over CP1. And for the rest of this talk, I will give CP1 a local holomorphic coordinate, uh, little z. Um, good. So CP1 also should be thought of as identified with the celestial sphere. Um, from a four-dimensional point of view. So throughout this talk, I'll interchangeably refer to CP1 as the twister sphere and the celestial sphere. And again, I'm being a little bit um, heuristic with various things, but that's how you should think of uh, this geometric part of twister space. So rather than having a simple complexification of four-dimensional Minkowski space, if we want something that will generate solutions to massless field equations in whatever space-time signature we wish, the natural uh, geometric space on which which we need to work is in fact this twister space. And the analog of uh, getting solutions to these massless field equations comes by way of the Penrose transform, which instead teaches us to build Dolbo cohomology classes on twister space valued in certain line bundles, which encode the spin or helicity of the massless particles in four dimensions. Um, and after building these cohomology classes, one can reduce to four dimensions and again, obtain solutions to massless field equations in the appropriate space-time signature. And again, I'll be I'll suppress the details since I won't use them explicitly in this talk, but morally, this is the kind of structure that's underpinning why we're using twister space and the sort of power that we have upstairs in six dimensions. So again, twister space, uh, in a one-line slogan is a useful geometric gadget for um, encoding and computing classical solutions to nonlinear massless field equations in four dimensions. Um, and just to give a, a little bit more notation for the rest of the talk, um, again, I'm concerned with massless fields in four dimensions, and uh, I'm going to label them by some massless momentum vector P mu. And I can employ this well-known isomorphism between SO4 and SL2 cross SL2 to rewrite this null momentum into so-called spinner helicity variables by means of this explicit map. And I'll always uh, write them in this way as lambda alpha and lambda tilde alpha dot. So you'll see these lambda variables appearing in various formulas if you're paying careful attention to the formulas on the slides. Uh, and if not, uh, not a big deal. Uh, mostly I'll be uh, talking through the important stuff. Uh, and lambda alpha, in particular, we can choose uh, affine coordinates for it um, that uh, I write in this way as 1z, where z is, again, the holomorphic coordinate on the twister sphere that's the base of my twister vibration. Um, and again, you should think of this as the holomorphic coordinate associated to the celestial sphere at null infinity as well. So the basic idea of, of uh, celestial holography should, is that there should be some kind of map, map or reframing between a four-dimensional scattering problem and a two-dimensional conformal field theoretic calculation or correlation function. And just by thinking about the map between two-dimensional uh, null variables and four-dimensional variables, it's not too hard to convince yourself that if I were studying an OPE limit on the celestial sphere, where I was imagining two vertex operators in some CFT coming very close together um, in these coordinates, that this OPE, lim uh, OPE limit of a putative vertex algebra corresponds in four dimensions to a collinear limit of a scattering problem, uh, where um, you know my uh, my uh, massless uh, particles on certain null trajectories are approaching uh, very close to one another. And this is well known to um, encode some universal uh, infrared aspects of scattering in various four-dimensional theories. So again, what I'd like to do today is discuss work uh, leveraging holomorphic theories living on twister space um, that makes connections uh, explicitly between four-dimensional physics and two-dimensional chiral algebras. Um, so very roughly, you know, why should such a correspondence even exist in the first place? Well, you might say that sort of the, the proto-observation of celestial holography is that the four-dimensional Lorentz group 
is isomorphic to the global conformal group in two dimensions, which acts naturally on the celestial sphere at null infinity by Mobius transformations. So there's some initially perhaps crude match of symmetries there. And in recent years, there's been increasingly refined and elaborate studies of enhancements of asymptotic symmetries in four dimensions, uh, which vastly um, enlarge this global conformal group in a variety of ways. And I will, again, I won't give the details of this work. It's, uh, you can find them in papers by Strominger and various collaborators. But by studying soft uh, limits, or rather suitable generalizations of soft limits, which are called conformally soft, so studying um, low energy physics in a certain uh, precise sense, one can find an enlargement of these asymptotic symmetry algebras. And by carefully looking at the structure of these asymptotic symmetry algebras, Strominger et al. found the structure, at least classically or at tree level in these four-dimensional theories, of two-dimensional chiral algebras. Uh, so this was the motivating example, or the, the kind of the motivating result uh, from the point of view of twisted holography um, that led us to believe that there might be some connection between these pictures. And indeed, you might say, well, a chiral algebra, and throughout this talk, I'll use the words chiral algebra and vertex algebra a bit interchangeably. So I mean, um, uh, properly speaking, a vertex algebra in a general sense, not necessarily a vertex operator algebra. Um, so loosely, you might say, well, a chiral algebra, as we know, is a holomorphic structure, which can appear as the algebra of symmetries of a, a full-fledged 2D conformal field theory. And in celestial holography, this is the sort of structure that um, you would like to find um, or, or that one might be hoping for. And you can certainly ask, you know, is that what we're finding here? Is indeed this chiral algebra, should we think of it as the associated algebra of symmetries, roughly speaking, to an honest two-dimensional conformal field theory supported on the celestial sphere? Um, so in work with Costello, we dug into this question a little bit, again, at the level of these chiral algebras of asymptotic symmetries, and we showed the following thing. So first of all, at tree level, classically, again, Strominger et al. found uh, associative, well-behaved classical chiral algebras of symmetries. And which chiral algebra you get depends on which four-dimensional theory you're studying. You can look at gauge theories. You can look at gravity um, theories with massless matter, et cetera, et cetera. But we showed in particular that if the four-dimensional theory in question admits a lift to a local holomorphic theory on twister space, then the chiral algebra remains an associative, well-defined chiral algebra at the quantum level as well. In fact, it gets deformed in an interesting way that I'll discuss generically. Um, but one can, in, if you wish, you can say that a lift to a local holomorphic theory on twister space for a four-dimensional theory is a sufficient condition to find a well-behaved, in particular, associative chiral algebra uh, beyond tree level as well. And such four-dimensional theories are, in fact, extremely special, as I'll discuss. Um, but indeed, by this uh, 4D, 2D dictionary, such a chiral algebra, when it exists, will then control collinear singularities in the scattering of the four-dimensional theory, not just classically, but at loop level. So S matrix people will uh, talk about uh, collinear splitting amplitudes, which provide some universal contribution to scattering in four dimensions. And those can be governed by chiral algebras at the quantum level as well um, for such special 4D theories. Now, um, okay, so when does a four dimensional theory admit a lift to a local holomorphic theory on twister space? Generically, we know that a lot of theories like ordinary Yang-Mills have lifts to twister space, which are non-local. And so, okay, perhaps there's some interesting generalization of a chiral algebra that one can study there, but that's not what I'm going to talk about today. That's a, um, a more difficult and complicated thing, and it would certainly require a, a reimagining of the kind of algebraic structures we want to talk about. Um, but it has been known for a while that there are some four-dimensional theories that are self-dual that admit nice classical lifts to twister space. But it turns out that even such theories which look local and holomorphic on twister space classically often suffer from one-loop gauge anomalies which render them inconsistent at loop level. 
And this has been recently studied by Costello and Costello and Lee. And that's perhaps not surprising because holomorphic theories are like chiral theories, which generically can suffer from gauge anomalies. And in the, indeed, that's the case here. So if we want to construct a 4D theory, which admits such a lift at the quantum level, thereby guaranteeing a well-defined two-dimensional chiral algebra um, at, the, at the quantum level, um, we will need to cancel this gauge anomaly somehow. And we'll have to focus on theories which, uh, which cure this, this six-dimensional anomaly in some way, as I'll mention. Um, and I'll call 4D theories that admit such a lift at the quantum level as well, twistorial theories. So I'll use that, that lingo from time to time. So again, just to summarize, these chiral algebras of asymptotic symmetries, while they're nice structures classically, you certainly want to ask for a putative holographic dictionary whether the structure survives beyond classical or tree level physics. And failures of associativity in the chiral algebra at the quantum level seem to be tied, and we make this precise in examples, uh, to gauge anomalies in twister space for theories that have a local holomorphic lift. And I want to stress that the four-dimensional theory isn't inconsistent. There's nothing wrong with a four-dimensional theory that doesn't admit a lift to twister space. I'm simply saying that the asymptotic symmetry algebra that it enjoys fails to be associative at the quantum level, which will at least complicate the interpretation of a celestial CFT dual. But you should think about these obstruction or these um, failures of the lift or the non-existences of such a lift as morally like an obstruction to the integrability of the four-dimensional theory. So obtaining an associative local chiral algebra on the celestial sphere can be done beyond the classical limit, but the 4D theories for which this seems to be true are integrable, extremely special theories um, whose form factors we can compute and relate to holomorphic objects or chiral correlation functions. Um, so let me give you an example of what a twistorial theory actually looks like. Um, well, in our papers, we focused on the case of self-dual Yang mills. And classically, again, this has been understood to have a local uh, holomorphic lift to twister space going back to work of Ward. So in four dimensions, we have this BF type action and I'm in Euclidean signature. I'll be talking about self-dual theories for the remainder of this talk. I have a BF type action where B is an anti-self-dual two form. And this admits a lift to twister space of, of the following type. One obtains a holomorphic BF theory in six dimensions, and upon reducing on my twister sphere or CP1, I'll land on this self-dual theory in four dimensions at the end of the day. We're here curly B and curly A are respectively a 3-1 and a 0-1 form on twister space, and both these fields have non-trivial gauge transformations. So in this formulation of self-dual Yang-Mills, we have um, gauge bosons of both helicities in four dimensions, which is uh, the standard definition of self-dual Yang-Mills for twister theorists, but not for everyone, so I just want to emphasize. But even though I have gauge bosons of positive and negative helicity, they obey a BF-type action, not the full, not the full Yang-Mills action. So classically, Ward showed that this BF-type uh, action, or self-dual Yang-Mills, admits a lift to a holomorphic BF theory on twister space. But what has been appreciated recently is that this correspondence fails at the quantum level, again, by means of this one loop gauge anomaly that the six dimensional theory has. So you can compute a one loop diagram that encodes the anomaly in the six dimensional theory. But it turns out that this anomaly can be canceled. And again, that was studied by these authors by means of a green Schwartz type mechanism on twister space. So you add in an additional uh, um, an additional sector and a new degree of freedom whose tree level exchange will cancel the contribution from the anomalous box diagram. And this green Schwartz mechanism can be undertaken for particular gauge algebras as these authors showed. So at the end of the day, in order to obtain a four dimensional twistorial theory, one has to couple to this extra sector who that, whose green Schwartz uh, tree level exchange will cancel the anomaly. Um, and in six dimensions, it takes a very specific form. 
for the cognoscenti, this looks like um, a BCOV type theory, um, coupling to the gauge sector by a trans simons like term. And that's not an accident, but I won't go into that here. And in four dimensions in particular, the theory that you get that now couples to self dual Yang Mills theory is a theory that has an additional real scalar field. And I call it an axion because it couples to the F wedge F term in an axionic way, but it has an unusual quartic kinetic term. Um, so the resulting theory in four dimensions is a non-unitary theory, although it is twistorial, so it has other nice properties. And, in, and it's also a conformal field theory. So it's a non-unitary, non-supersymmetric conformal theory in four dimensions that ends up being twistorial at the end of the day. And these scalar fields with quartic kinetic terms show up in other parts of life uh, in four dimensions where they appear to cancel conformal anomalies in other contexts. So um, perhaps that's not a surprise to, to those of you that know those stories. So this is an example of a twistorial theory, but everything I say will also apply to self-dual gravity or to other self-dual gauge theories with certain choices of matter, provided you also um, include the appropriate anomaly canceling subsector there as well. Um, and uh, let me just check the time. Okay. So you can compute form factors in these theories which as I say, are scattering in the presence of additional um, local operator insertions. If you're computing form factors in self-dual Yang Mills, a natural choice of local operator that one can insert um, into your scattering problem is the trace B squared operator. Because as some of you might know, if I add a trace B squared operator uh, to my Lagrangian, with coefficient uh, the Yang-Mills coupling, then I recover Yang-Mills theory, uh, at least perturbatively in the first order formalism. So that's the natural thing you would add if you want to deform to full Yang-Mills theory. And so it's an interesting form factor to compute in the self-dual theory. Although of course I have now not just self-dual Yang-Mills, but I really have this axionic contribution um, as well. Um, and I won't go into the details of the diagrammatics, but um, I think it's, just to emphasize with form factors, you can get kind of a, a large host of interesting and non-vanishing observables in the self dual yang mills theory that you don't get by cons considering just ordinary scattering. So indeed my four dimensional theory is now a conformal theory. So I have to kind of consider something else to get a non an interesting observable and form factors will do the job here. But even in, in self dual Yang Mills theory by itself, it's kind of known to famously um, only have uh, to be one loop exact. It has a non vanishing all plus one loop uh, amplitude and, and nothing else. So there's a, this is a, a rich class of observables to consider that uh, ends up giving quite, quite interesting results. Uh, there was a hand raised, and this is a natural time for me to pause. So um, did, Sorry, is there uh, still a question? Yeah. Um it, can you cancel the anomaly by supersymmetrizing the theory? Yes, n equals four um, is also anomaly free. So you can do that, but that's just not my main focus today. Mm -hmm. um, good. So given a twistorial theory, like the one I just presented for the uh, self-dual Yang Mills plus an axion, or again, any of the other self-dual theories that are anomaly canceled in appropriate ways, um, you can study um, an associated chiral algebra, which are the algebra of asymptotic symmetries, if you wish, formed by the conformally soft modes, which had, again has been studied by Strominger et al. in various contexts, and which governs the collinear singularities of the corresponding four-dimensional theory, in particular, uh, collinear singularities in the corresponding form factors. Um, so this associated, uh, uh, the associated chiral algebra of these asymptotic symmetries can be obtained uh, from a method called Kazool duality, studying Kazool duality of the 60 theory on the twister sphere. So I'll say what that means and why that comes up momentarily, but let me first just give a physical picture for how the chiral algebra emerges. Um, so to obtain this chiral algebra, uh, uh, for my for my six dimensional theory, the one associated to collinear scattering of my four dimensional theory on the twister sphere, um, what I want to do is consider various on shell field configurations which are localized at points on the twister sphere. These should naturally correspond to local operators or vertex operators inserted on the celestial sphere. 
And it's very easy to build localized on shell background configurations for fields on Twister space. So here's kind of a schematic example with my curly A gauge field. It's localized at some points on the Twister sphere, and it has some polynomial dependence in the fiber coordinates on Twister space. Um, and this uh, is in one-to-one -one correspondence with the states in the vacuum module of my chiral algebra or the generators of my chiral algebra. So for curly A, I'll associate them to some modes that I call J, and these should be um, viewed as corresponding to the conformally soft modes of positive helicity gauge fields in four dimensions. Indeed, you can study um, a natural action of the Virasoro algebra on these gauge fields, or more generally, uh, field, such similar field configurations for any fields you have in your theory. And you'll discover that these are conformal primary states with respect to this natural Virasoro action, and they have mostly negative integer conformal weight. So reducing them via the Penrose transform down to four dimensions, again, you'll naturally land on conformal primary states of mostly negative integer conformal weight, uh, which are precisely the conformal modes studied in the celestial holography uh, program, which generate these very large chiral algebras of asymptotic symmetries. So these are indeed the natural, um, the natural states that, that one is trying to get. And we study such field configurations, again, for every field that you have in your six-dimensional theory. So for self dual yang mills coupled to this axion field, I'll have a tower of generators from the curly A. Um, I'll also have negative helicity uh, gauge bosons that I call J tilde, which come from the associated field configurations in curly B. And I'll also have two towers of modes that I call E and F, which come from the quartic axion field. So it's like two second order uh, scalar contributions. So in total, I have four towers of generators in my chiral algebra, and they have mostly negative integer conformal weight. So at the end of the day, this chiral algebra of asymptotic symmetries um, is a very large non-unitary algebra and kind of an unusual structure. Of course, we don't just want the generators, but we want to obtain the OPEs for this chiral algebra. Classically, um, we should recover uh, the algebra obtained by Strominger et al. from other methods, uh, you know, transforming collinear Wait, limits. No, I, have I have a question. I have a yes. question. Oh, could you go back? Um, mm -hmm. What's the difference? So weight means conformal weight? Ah, uh, sorry. No. Um, so, well, what, which, one, which of these is the conformal weight? Spin. Um, and I say that because they're purely holomorphic, so the yeah. conformal, okay. yeah, okay. sorry about okay. that, yeah. Um, yeah, sorry for the confusion. Um, good, so of course we don't just want to identify the generators, but we want a prescription for obtaining the OPEs as well. Classically, we'd like to recover, um, again, the OPEs found by other asymptotic symmetry methods. Um, but in particular, when the chiral algebra exists, as it does for this tw these twistorial theories, we want to also be able to compute possible deformations that incorporate um, uh, higher loop collinear uh, splitting functions in, in the amplitude. So possible quantum deformations of these chiral algebras. Um, and there's a natural way to do it. So this is kind of the physical prescription. Um, what we do is we study the natural analog of uh, generalized Wilson lines in this holomorphic context. So normally, if we want to study some generalized Wilson line, we have inserted in the path integral some path ordered exponential of a, U of a gauge current coupling, an AJ type coupling localized on the support of our Wilson loop or Wilson line. Here, the chiral algebra is supported on the twister sphere, the celestial sphere. So I have an integral only over that CP1. And in holomorphic theories, it turns out one can also add um, these additional derivatives. So this is the holomorphic analog of an AJ, of an AJ type coupling. Uh, so nothing, nothing particularly mysterious there. And we just like to ask, um, under what conditions are such couplings gauge or BRST invariant between my bulk theory and this putative holomorphic defect or generalized Wilson line. So if I were in an ordinary gauge theory, I would open my quantum field theory textbook and I would ask for gauge invariance of the path ordered exponential of an integral of AJ. And gauge invariance would tell me that the Js satisfy uh, 
the, the standard algebra where J A J B minus J B J A is F A B C J C. Um, I could of course get nothing else but the current algebra associated to the gauge algebra. There's nothing else that can really happen. Um, if I run the same analysis in this holomorphic story, well, first of all, instead of getting a commutator among the J's, I get an operator product expansion because they live on a holomorphic defect. But more interestingly, in these holomorphic theories, we find that there's room for this uh, current algebra to deform in an interesting way. And indeed it does. So at tree level, one recovers, again, the natural current algebra for the gauge symmetry, um, but one, will obtain deformations that come from expanding this path ordered exponential order by order. And the chiral algebra will deform, and one can compute um, the resulting constraints placed on the currents, which take the form of non-trivial OPEs, quite explicitly. Namely, if you work at a given order in perturbation theory, you can write things down diagrammatically in terms of these schematic kind of bulk defect couplings. You compute the BRST variation of all the diagrams at some given loop order, and you demand that they have to be zero because the total thing just has to be gauge invariant. Um, and that will give uh, the universal chiral algebra that's allowed by gauge or BRST invariance. So this is just a prescription to obtain this universal symmetry algebra um, from kind of a natural uh, physical point of view. Um, and it can be done explicitly. And it turns out to coincide with uh, the notion of causal duality in mathematics. Uh, but for a physicist, this is, this is all you, you need to think about. It's just studying gauge invariant couplings to an arbitrary order type defect supported on this twister sphere in this case. And in holomorphic theories, we get interesting deformations beyond tree level. Um, okay. Now, for the mathematicians in the audience, maybe I wanted to say a little bit about why I'm calling this operation Kazul duality. And in particular, I want to emphasize that um, Kazul duality for vertex algebras, which is what I'm implicitly employing here, is something that I haven't, you know, it's not fully defined mathematically. I'm kind of giving you the physicist definition of it, but I will be able to connect um, to Kazul duality for other algebras. And so I wanted to briefly review that story to kind of say, why am I describing this mathematically as a Kazul duality type operation and, and um, illuminate what the connections with mathematics should be when I perform these kinds of computations. Um, but for the physicist, this is all I'm doing. And the punchline is that one can obtain the celestial chiral algebra, including non-trivial uh, deformations at the quantum level for twistorial theories, uh, which guarantee that the chiral algebra exists. Um, okay, so the physicists maybe can go to sleep for a little while. Um, this part is more for the mathematicians. I want to just give a brief interlude on why Kazul duality appears in the problem of bulk defect couplings of order type. And I'll illustrate this for associative algebras where we do understand the connection in detail. And um, the hope is that the formal, the appropriate formalization for vertex algebras um, can be understood, um, hopefully with some collaboration between physicists and mathematicians. And I wrote an expository paper on uh, this point of view with Williams, although we also computed some new examples. Um, so if you're interested, uh, I, I'll recommend this paper for, for more details. Uh, before I get to the brief interlude, um, this is maybe also a good point to stop for questions briefly. Okay. So again, I claim that Kazul duality is something that happens when you want to couple an order type defect to some Lagrangian theory. And I can make this, uh, this um, connection sharpest in the case of line defects, in particular topological line defects, as I'll explain. And so let me give a very quick kind of summary punchline, and then I'll make it a little bit more, uh, I'll explain sort of where these things come from and the ingredients that I need to actually make this precise. So I have some bulk theory, which I'll call A, and I wish to couple it to some one-dimensional theory along the support of some fixed line. And I'll call that one-dimensional theory, theory B. So at the level of actions, I'll have the sum of two a priori independent Lagrangian theories, and I wish to couple them together by some local Lagrangian uh, or some local action, which I'll think of as, as a generalized Wilson line in, in my original theory A. 
So at the level of local operators, I have some model for these theories in mind, at least on the support, when I think of the algebras on the line. Um, and initially, before I try to couple them together, they're just some differential graded algebras, curly A and curly B. Um, when they're uncoupled, I think of them as just a tensor product of algebras. And since they're generically DG algebras, they come equipped with two uh, independent differentials, which I can then sum. So if I'm dealing in gauge theories, then deltas are delta can be in general the BRST differential of the two a priori uh, uncoupled theories. In supersymmetric theories, these might be associated to supercharge charges, and in twisted theories, there'll be sums. And again, I'm asking the same physical question I just asked in the previous slide. What are the constraints on the path ordered exponential of this coupling term, SAB? And again, so just to, just to emphasize, I'm assuming that A and B are separately BRST invariant, so that delta A and delta B are both nilpotent BRST differentials. So I'm assuming that. And given that, I just want to ask, what are the constraints on the path ordered exponential of SAB that are imposed by BRST invariants of the possible coupling terms? And in the particular context I'm going to be studying, it turns out that the possible space of couplings um, is controlled by more Cartan elements of A tensor B. So certain al um, algebra elements satisfying this equation which are known to be in bijective correspondence with algebra-preserving homomorphisms from the Kazul dual algebra A shriek into B. So the claim is that A shriek is kind of the algebra of operators for a universal line defect for theory A. Um, all other, you know, I have to, um, it, it's kind of governs the universal um, symmetries required for such a coupling to exist. Now, how does that actually come about? In order to really make it precise, you have to think of twisted theories, which are also the purview of twisted holography and where these connections um, to holography will ultimately come about. So what's a twisted theory? I'll begin with a supersymmetric theory on flat space in Euclidean signature. I will only care about theories in flat space, roughly speaking, for the purposes of this talk. And when I say I want to study a twist, I just want to make a choice of nilpotent supercharge in my super point Carré algebra and compute the cohomology with respect to that supercharge. And to be a little bit more precise, if I start life with a gauge theory with its own BRST differential, then properly speaking, I'm going to deform the BRST differential um, delta by taking it to delta plus Q and studying the cohomology of this um, deformed differential. I'll be a little, again, I'll be a little bit loose, but um, there's more precise details in the paper I wrote with Williams. So I just, when I say twist, I simply mean that I want to compute the cohomology with respect to this nilpotent differential. And I have some choices of nilpotent supercharge, so I have a variety of possible twists. And indeed, many such twists have been studied in a variety of contexts and are known to have extremely rich connections to mathematics. Um, and normally, if I want to do something a little bit more refined, I can, for example, choose a twisting homomorphism from the Euclidean Lorentz group into the R symmetry group, such that the stress energy tensor becomes exact to obtain topological field theories, whereby the algebra of local operators will have the structure of an ED type algebra. But generically, I don't necessarily want to do this. Um, I won't be choosing a such a homomorphism in general, I just want to compute the cohomology of this twisted differential. And that means that generically on flat space, I'll have some theory that um, in general is holomorphic or perhaps of, of mixed holomorphic topological dependence. Um, okay. So in the context of these twisted supersymmetric theories, I can make this connection to Kazul duality precise. How do I do that? Um, well, kind of the main object of study or the kind of the main technique that one needs for these twisted theories to make this connection is called descent. Um, so how does that work? Um, I'll illustrate it for the case of topological field theories, although there's a holomorphic generalization, um, which I won't review, but which we use over and over again. And the basic idea is the following. The local operators I can study are those uh, that are in my Q cohomology. Um, so I study Q closed modded out by Q exact local, local operators. 
And there's another interesting class of, um, of observables, which I can obtain in Q cohomology in these twisted theories. Um, and in particular, I can use um, these observables to also generate interesting deformations of my uh, underlying twisted theory. And it goes like this. I have some super Poincaré algebra, and I'll just write it in this way, where Q is the choice of nilpotent supercharge with respect to which I'm taking the cohomology, and Q mu is uh, the supercharge which trivializes translations uh, in the mu direction. So P mu is the momentum uh, momentum generator of my super Poincaré algebra in that direction. So I'm just rewriting the super Poincaré algebra at the level of these anti-commutators such that I have a whole vector of supercharges trivializing translations in all these directions. And again, there's holomorphic generalizations, but never mind that. I can build a K-form descendant by simply acting on my on a Q-closed local operator repeatedly by this extra vector of supercharges and multiplying them by um, corresponding differential forms. And if I act on these K-form descendants with my twisting supercharge Q, I don't get something Q-closed on the nose. Rather, I get something that's um, a total derivative with respect to the Durham differential of my theory. So in particular, if I take these K-form descendants, I can certainly integrate them over a non-trivial cycle, gamma K, to obtain a Q-closed observable. And there's lots of interesting things one can do with descendants. I won't go into all of them. It's a very rich story. And there's a nice paper by several of the organizers of, of, um, of this colloquium series that can tell you more. But in particular, if I, want, if I look at a descendant uh, um, of top degree, I can integrate it over space time or on the support of a defect that I'm interested in and obtain a non-trivial deformation of my original theory. So I'm going to use descendants to generate deformations of my original theory, which um, are bulk defect couplings. So for example, for the case of a topological line, I'll consider a situation in which my twisting supercharge Q um, has an anti-commutator with some trivializing supercharge that I'll call Q hat, such that translations along some some linear direction RT, so I'll call the corresponding momentum generator PT, are cohomologically trivial. Again, translations along some line are cohomologically trivial. I'll call this the topological line that I'm interested in. And I want to study generic generalized Wilson lines uh, supported on this topological direction. So um, the algebra of bulk local operators will be some kind of associative algebra on the line. More precisely, it'll be some kind of A infinity algebra um, along the support of this one dimensional submanifold. And I'd like to take this uh, bulk theory and couple it to some one dimensional theory um, such that translations along that theory are also cohomologically trivial. So it's a topological quantum mechanics theory, if you wish. And this theory B will also have an operator algebra, which also will be an associative algebra of some kind made suitably homotopic. So how can I couple these two super twisted supersymmetric theories together along the line? Well, I can build a one form descendant supported along that line. So in order to build a one form descendant, as I'll need to integrate over a one dimensional submanifold, I start with a Q close or I start with a local operator in cohomological degree one, or physically this is like ghost number one. And I descend once to get a one form observable. I integrate it over my line and I insert it in a path ordered exponential to obtain a generalized Wilson line. Um, and the claim is that this generalized Wilson line or bulk defect coupling is BRST invariant to all orders in perturbation theory if and only if O satisfies the associated more Carton equation. And this claim uh, follows from a very brief argument that just crucially uses the fact that I've built this coupling via the descent procedure. So it's not hard to show. I won't show it in view of time, but you can see the details in my papers. And properly speaking, if you're dealing with A infinity algebras, you need to use the full A infinity structure. Um, 
but the idea, you know, whether you're thinking in a DG associative world or in an A infinity world, the, the conclusion is the same. You need more Carton elements to build gauge invariant couplings. So, so by the descent construction, classically, the fact that this coupling is BRST invariant with respect to my twisted BRST differential is guaranteed, but quantum mechanically, you need the stronger condition of it being a more Carton element to have a gauge, in, a gauge invariant uh, coupling. Sorry, Natalie, I don't understand. Yep. Something. You you have two A infinity algebras A and B. So is are the are the mu's the multiplication on some A infinity structure on the tensor product? Um yeah. So I think as it's, I've written it here. As you know, it's not trivial to take a tensor product of A infinity algebras and get an A infinity algebra. No, no, indeed. As in, I've written as I've written it here, I've assumed A is an A infinity algebra and B is just an ordinary associative algebra, and one has to Oh, okay. Tree things. Yeah, indeed. Okay. Um, so I don't want to um, go too badly over time. So let me just conclude by kind of emphasizing um, why, you know, em emphasizing the point that this is secretly Kazool duality in disguise. So from a twisted supersymmetric theory, we construct bulk defect couplings by descent, and we're guaranteed BRST or gauge invariance to all orders in perturbation theory if these are more Carton elements. And one can see in various um, mathematical sources, like this, there's a classic textbook here, um, and there's other references by Lurie and many, many others, um, that more Carton elements of the type that we need are in bijective correspondence with algebra preserving maps between a shriek, the Kazool dual, and my um, arbitrary topological quantum mechanics algebra, curly B, where a shriek is given a precise definition in terms of derived homomorphisms. Um, and I'm being a little sloppy. I really need um, augmented algebras here, and there's a physical understanding of that. But in view of time, I'll refer to my paper for the details. But these things um, are related to one another in a bijective way. Um, so from this very physical construction of relating couplings obtained by defects and just studying their BRST um, variations, I'm naturally landing on equivalently um, maps, algebra-preserving maps from A shriek into B. Uh, and if I had a little more time, I'd, I'd motivate this in more detail, but one can always ask me later if you're interested or, or um, the details are also in my paper. Um, but essentially, if I want to couple my bulk theory to some defect algebra B, then the algebra of operators in, in curly B had better form a representation of A shriek. That's kind of all there is to it. A shriek in, in the case of pure gauge theory, a shriek is just the universal enveloping algebra of G, um, which is of course the usual statement that a generalized Wilson line has to have its um, has to have currents J that satisfy the current algebra of the gauge algebra. Um, now, physically, I've run the same program for vertex algebras, where I emphasize I'm just using the physical understanding, if you like, kind of the more Carton side of the argument. I don't have um, the bijective correspondence to an independent definition of a Kazool dual algebra A shriek in that case. I hope one exists, but this is um, a conjecture, and I hope there's there will be more collaboration on this front. But physically, I can proceed in the vertex algebra case using the same type of logic, now studying holomorphic defects on surfaces rather than topological lines. In the case of twisted holography, you actually need a little bit more. You want to think of D brains, whose in, the, in twisted string theory, D brains have world volume theories given by holomorphic Chern Simons theories, or in upon dimensionally reducing, you get chiral algebras. So they're precisely the right things to kind of couple um, as a holomorphic defect to a twisted closed string theory. Um, that's an, an open closed duality is like the physical seed of holography. So that's how these things relate together. But as many of you know, D brains, even in topological strings or, or in these twisted contexts can back react on the geometry. And so if you want to study holography um, in, in a twisted sense, you need to incorporate that effect as well. And that can also naturally be done using the same kind of logic. Um, if the D brain sources some field which back reacts on the geometry, and in the twisted case, it will couple to a Kadira Spencer theory of supergravity and deform the complex structure of the background metric, um, 
you get an extra term in your action, which is gauge non-invariant on the world volume of the brains. And you also have to incorporate that when you run this causal duality type analysis, but it can be done. And we've done it in some ADS CFT examples and, and one finds expected central extensions of boundary algebras in that context. And again, happy to talk more about that, but in view of time, I, I wanna kind of uh, move on and get to, to the punchline of things. Um, and, and again, loop corrections can be computed in this case too, using this prescription. So that's all I wanted to say about Kazool duality. And in the last little bit of time, I'll go just maybe five minutes over. I wanna emphasize how these techniques can come about in celestial holography and be used to obtain a top-down model there. So I can do Kazool duality and I can obtain the OPEs, including quantum deformations of my celestial chiral algebra. And I stress um, that if I just did this analysis in ordinary self dual yang mills theory with states of both positive and negative helicities, but without my axion, my axionic type field, then the chiral algebra would fail to be associative at loop level. And the axion field is necessary for its restoration here. And indeed, you can compute this explicitly, find additional terms mediated by this axion exchange, and find that the coefficients in these OPEs are fixed by the same Green-Schwartz gauge anomaly canceling coefficients in the six dimensional twister theory. Um, but at tree level, if you turn off the axion, indeed you, you reobtain the chiral algebras of Strominger at all. Um, so, so that hangs together. But for self-dual Yang mills, you, know, you can compute interesting one loop collinear singularities and deform the algebra by thinking about these things. But um, you know, there's no further interesting collinear singularities at higher loops. So the story um, kind of stops there. As I said, we um, Costello and I showed that you can compute form factors and show that they're isomorphic to chiral correlators in the two-dimensional theory. Um, but that's a story I think for another day, although we get some cute results. And again, if you're interested, just please ask me. We get a bevy of interesting, um, we recover a bevy of interesting formulas from the amplitudes literature. Um, and so this gives kind of a, a different interpretation of the holomorphicity of some special amplitudes like MHB amplitudes. But anyway, I just want to now conclude by kind of taking all of these pieces and putting them together and constructing a twisted holography example of asymptotically flat holography. So I'm going to take another twistorial theory. self dual yang mills plus the axion isn't the only 4D theory that's twistorial. You can do things with self dual gravity too, and I'll just highlight a beautiful recent paper by Biddleston. But for this talk, I'm going to focus on yet one more twistorial theory. It's a four-dimensional WZW model, which is like a 4D sigma model whose target manifold is the group manifold for SO8. And again, it's coupled to a certain anomaly canceling quartic scalar. And why I want to focus on this theory, um, well, if I uplift this thing to twister space, and again, it's twistorial, so I can do that, you see that these two coupled theories come from um, a Green-Schwartz mechanism for a topological type one string. So for these theories, we have a real understanding of the twisted string theory or topological string theory uplift. So upstairs in six dimensions on twister space, we get the associated Kadira Spencer theory and holomorphic Chern Simons theory for the twisted type one string. And back downstairs in four dimensions, they give us this funny WZD, WZW4 model coupled to what's called a Kähler scalar. So there's a twisted string theory uplift of this model. Um, and the 4D theories are also fairly well understood. Um, I won't go into the details. Again, this is a very special and integrable four-dimensional theory. I've carefully chosen it to be twistorial and to have a nice topological string uplift, which we understand. But this is the seed for holography and asymptotically flat space times. Um, and using methods from twisted holography and Kazool duality, we can obtain observables very precisely. This is, this is work with Costello and Sharma. So given that there's a type one topological string upstairs in six dimensions, um, I can now run kind of my usual holographic logic. I want to study an open closed type duality in the topological string and build a holographic duality. So I do what I always do in physics. I add a large number N of additional D1 brains in this case. And I'll wrap them on the twister sphere or the celestial sphere because the open string sector, I want to be my boundary 
uh, or field theory dual, my holographic dual. So the world volume theory of this large number of D1 brains is going to wrap the celestial sphere. It's going to be supported on the celestial sphere. And it will give us, in fact, a well-defined chiral algebra supported on the celestial sphere. Um, so that will be my kind of boundary analog of a holographic dual, which I can obtain from string theory methods. And moreover, a large number of brains will back react on the geometry. So I can also see how the metric deforms. And in twisted holography, it's the complex structure that's being deformed. And I can study the closed string dual by open closed string duality and obtain um, a non-trivial bulk theory on a curved manifold. And it can be computed explicitly. In Kadir Spencer theory, we do the computation. And downstairs in four dimensions, what happens is that our flat, our, um, you know, we started life in four dimensional flat space time, and the complex structure deforms, um, and we obtain what's called the Burns metric. So there's a very explicit computation that can be done. And the closed string side of the duality um, is our four dimensional WZW4 theory plus the scalar scalar on the Burns metric. And burn space note is asymptotically fine. So in particular, if I did everything carefully and put the pieces together, I get a holographic dual in the kind of a very standard sense. On the one hand, from a bunch of brains on a wrapping twister space, I get an explicit chiral algebra whose world volume theory I can compute using well-known topological string methods, and it's ex an extremely explicit gauged beta gamma system. And on the other hand, I have my four-dimensional theory now in this curved uh, burn space, which is asymptotically flat. And so here I want to emphasize that in contrast to kind of the tree level and one loop studies of the chiral algebra from celestial holography before, now I have a family of chiral algebras defined even at finite n. And they will control collinear scattering to all orders in this four-dimensional uh, quantum field theory on my curved burn space metric. Um, so because of the integrability and specialness of these 40 theories, we can really nail down an extremely precise holographic dictionary, at least in principle, to all orders in N, although we explicitly did some checks at the planar level to start. And of course, we hope to say more uh, beyond the planar level. But I just want to emphasize that this is quite analogous to the usual ADS-CFT correspondence in a very traditional sense. There's a family of chiral algebras with a nice infinite n limit, and there is a four-dimensional theory on a curved space-time um, that we can, whose scattering we can study precisely. And indeed, at the planar level, we've matched the OPEs with the collinear scattering of, of these theories. So we get a genuine kind of garden variety holographic duality from these twisted holography methods. And the boundary chiral algebra can be computed classically and beyond using these Kazool duality methods. Although again, I hope that um, we'll understand better what mathematically what Kazool duality is for vertex algebras in the future. And since I'm out of time and I apologize for being um, a little bit brief at the end, um, let me just summarize. So we have a concrete toy model of a celestial holography type correspondence, um, completely analogous to supersymmetric sectors of ADS-CFT, which we studied using twisted holography or open closed duality in the topological string, as well as leveraging these Kazool duality type methods to obtain the dual chiral algebra, order by order and perturbation theory. And Associative chiral algebras, you know, I know how to build associative chiral algebras only for these very special integrable or self-dual 4D theories with the tristorial uplifts. So there's a serious remaining open question of how we think of holography for generic non-twistorial theories um, in asymptotically flat space times. How, how can we build and understand such duals? How can the, the notions of chiral algebras be deformed appropriately to accommodate um, these, these non-integrable theories, or if they can be, and, and so on. These are all still very much open questions, but I just want to stress that we have now a precise top-down model where we can really start attacking these problems and, um, and doing precise computations and a real kind of um, concrete example of a duality where we can compute things on both sides and push forward. So I hope that will be helpful in our understanding for holography, um, in particular for asymptotically flat spacetimes. I am also optimistic that there's going to be a lot of fun connections with mathematics. 
um, in particular at the level of Kazool duality for vertex algebras, and also what's called curved Kazool duality to incorporate back reaction, which would be like adding a source term to the more Cartan equation. And it would be great to see these ideas fully developed to see if we can get all orders results or proofs of twisted holography, both in ADS and in flat space contexts. So I'm optimistic about having a lot of fun with these ideas with physicists and mathematicians um, over the next few years. And let me apologize for going over and thank you for your, your attention. Great, thanks. Let's uh, thank the speaker. And I think we, we still have time for a, a few questions. So if anyone has a question, just go ahead and unmute yourself and speak out. Everyone's ready for Christmas or holiday vacation. <laughs> one question well, too, about but I'm you one. So, um, yeah, to, uh, oh, yeah. Oh. sorry, both, I think Tudor and was also saying something. Oh, go ahead, Tudor. Um, just at, at the very end, so, yeah. so you mentioned that, that there isn't an independent mathematical statement of causal duality for chiral algebras. Um, do you know what what's missing or what what that would entail? Yeah, so what I'd really like is so kind of this piece of the correspondent well okay there, there's actually a few things. So you have to define what you mean by the space of solutions to the more Cartan equation for a tensor B when A and B are vertex algebras. Um, now we know there's kind of a natural Lie algebra that one can extract from vertex algebras by looking at the residues of the single order poles. Um, so that kind of tells you perhaps what you should be getting on the left-hand side um, morally, but then establishing that that is related to some universal vertex algebra that one can define independently by some derived um, homomorphism type construction. Yeah, I don't have an, in so I, my definition of the Kazool dual of a vertex algebra is precisely if I run this BRST invariant argument and work order by order in the OPEs, whatever OPE structure I get, I call that the Kazool dual, the universal thing, the universal symmetry algebra you need to couple to a holomorphic defect. Um, but I don't have an independent definition like I do in the associative algebra case. So, so, so you've, you've effectively computed the, the deformation theory in, in yeah examples. yeah yeah exactly exactly thanks and thanks a lot for the talk at, at some point you said that you computed the the mhv and the n mhv amplitudes yeah and in which four-dimensional theory it was yeah great so sorry i know i have i know i had that slide somewhere was it after the interlude? Yes, it was. Okay, um, good. So I was computing form factors in self dual Yang mills coupled to the axion, but at tree level, the axion doesn't come into play. It's effectively a one loop contribution because it's a green Schwartz type mechanism. So at tree level, I kind of just have self dual Yang mills, if you wish. Those are the only degrees of freedom that are actually contributing. And so if I compute a form factor in self dual Yang mills, where I insert the local operator trace B squared, which is precisely the thing that deforms self dual Yang mills to full Yang mills, then a form factor with that choice of local operator insertion at tree level is going to recover the corresponding um, quantity in, in ordinary Yang mills. And at one loop, as I say here, you know, the, the physics of the axion comes in. And um, so I would be, so this thing, for example, is, um, like a one loop diagram in Yang Mills theory, but coupled to this axion. And you can see that like the analytic structure is far, far simpler than the one loop form factor without the axion and ordinary Yang Mills would be. So the axion is kind of serving to restore the integrability of, of this theory. Um, and it would be cool to go beyond, like to use the axion to kind of extract predictions for full Yang Mills and, and go for farther than that. Um, yeah, and Kevin also has some some work that'll appear soon, going kind of to two loop and and playing with these things some more. So yeah, it, it's a it's a fun story. But, uh, but Does that's any why of it works. interact? 
Did, does any of it interact at all with the ideas, you know, the idea that Witten and others had about using, uh, uh, you know, D-brains in twister space to make the deformation? I mean, um, I, so cl clearly a lot of these things are really close. I don't, I don't understand the string theoretic uplift of self Yang mills plus the axion. Like I only understand kind of the string theory uplift well for, for example, the WZW4 model or for, you know, 4DN equals four um, self Yang mills and its deformations and so on. So I don't want to say for sure it's clearly definitely related just because for this particular theory, I don't feel that I understand the string uplift well enough, but obviously for other theories, um, where we do understand the string uplift better, it's there's close connections, and, and uh, twist right amplitudes people, I, I think understand them better than I do. But yeah, great, Th thank you. Um, all right, well, I think uh, in view of the time, we better cut it off here. Uh, so thanks again for this uh, beautiful talk. It's thanks to again. Thanks. And so that's the last WHCGP for this uh, for this year, this calendar year. So we'll see you back in January. I'm not sure I understand. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Great. That's that's something to end on. Okay. Thanks again. Sure. Um, I'll turn off the recording, but I'll leave the room open if someone wants to hang around. Yeah, I can. I'm around for, I can be around for a few more minutes if there's any lingering questions. I've got to head out, but it was yeah. really nice to see you. And thanks. It's great to see you. Awesome talk. Yeah. yeah.